Jane Weber, and uh, he is accompanied by Mr. James C. Treadway, Executive Vice President of Payne Weber. We'll be, we'll be pleased to have you testify. Gentlemen, if you first stand, please. Raise your right hand. Repeat after me. I solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. I solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Mr. Meron, for the record, uh, uh, Ms. Treadway, I would like to state the obvious. You are appearing on a voluntary basis. We appreciate your presence. And uh, we apologize to you for uh, the long hearing that we are in the midst of. Uh, we still have two witnesses following you. Uh, I suggest uh, uh, if you have any opening statements, sir, uh, it will be entered into the record in its entirety. You may summarize it in any way you choose. Yes, I'd like to make a brief opening statement, if I can, Mr. Please Chairman. do, sir, and if I might ask you, pull all the mics very close to you, sir. Okay. We'll okay. hear you fully. Okay. Thank you. I am Donald Marin, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Payne Weber Group. I'm pleased to appear today to provide information to the subcommittee in connection with its ongoing inquiry into various HUD-related matters. A little bit about Payne Weber. Through our various subsidiaries, including our major broker-dealer subsidiary, Payne Weber Incorporated, Payne Weber Group provides a wide variety of financial services to individuals, to institutions, to public, and to corporate clients. We conduct business through 285 offices worldwide and we're staffed by approximately 12,500 employees. Our firm maintains approximately 1.5 million brokerage accounts for customers, has total assets of about $18 billion and gross revenues in 1988 of $2.5 billion. The subcommittee has asked that we address three They're issues. just a little bit bigger than HUD. <laughs> Uh, the subcommittee has asked that we address three issues. The first was the results of our internal fact-finding inquiry into certain matters. The second is our company's policy on permissible business activities by employees, namely activities to secure contracts. And third, our company's limitations on the performance of outside consulting work by our own employees. If I may first answer the second two questions. On the second question, we do not allow employees to engage in outside business activities, including consulting work, without the prior written approval of the employee's manager or supervisor and our compliance department. We are in a regulated industry and we have to make sure that we have our own rules and regulations. Our code of conduct provides, quote, employees must not engage in outside activities prior to obtaining the written approval of the compliance department, unquote. Uh, in the case of uh, Lance Wilson, we have no record that Mr. Wilson requested or received any such approval. Various written compliance department directives and notices to our employees also publicize Payne Weber's restrictions on outside business activities without prior approval. At the end of 1988, Mr. Wilson signed the annual certificate we require of all our professional employees in which he certified, among other things, that he had complied with all of Payne Weber policies, procedures, guidelines, and directives, which would include our code of conduct. To respond to the third question, with respect to employees' business activities on behalf of Payne Weber, whether they are related to securing contracts or any other business activity on behalf of Payne Weber, our code of conduct uh, requires that, quote, all such activities are to be conducted in complete accordance with the applicable laws and regulations of the United States and all countries in which we do business. Our code of conduct further provides unethical business practices will subject employees to appropriate internal disciplinary action and may result in prosecution for violating federal, state, or foreign laws. I might also say, Mr. Chairman, that we expect our employees not only to adhere to the letter of the law but to the spirit of the law as well. Our code of conduct is distributed to and is binding upon all employees from the top to the bottom of our organization without exception. Appearing with me today is Jim Treadway, Executive Vice President of Payne Weber, who directed our internal fact-finding inquiry. With the subcommittee's permission, Mr. Treadway will comment on the results of that inquiry 
and I might say that my instructions to him were to be thorough and complete and that Payne Weber was to respond to all questions of the subcommittee as fully and as completely as possible, which we intend to do today. Before he makes his presentation, Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to make one comment, if I may. Please. I'd like to emphasize that Payne Weber, as a responsible corporate citizen, has and will continue to cooperate fully with your subcommittee. Furthermore, we applaud the efforts of this subcommittee to inquire into the matters that have received so much public attention. It is to the advantage of no one, whether a private citizen or a company seeking to conduct business with a federal body, for the government process to be anything other than open and fair and with decisions made on the merits. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Miron. Uh, I'd be happy to hear from you, Mr. President. Do I need this one also? Uh, or just, just, is this one, one is enough if you push it quite, uh, quite near uh, you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman, I am Jim Treadway an executive vice president of Payne Weber. We have previously submitted a 33-page uh, document uh, which represents in full um, the results of our fact-finding inquiry. And I, I may, I'd like to summarize that uh, just briefly. Please. Uh, and note that in the course of doing our inquiry, we focused on several general areas which we have identified in our full length submission. In doing our uh, inquiry, among other things, we also reviewed Lance Wilson's Payne Weber files, interviewed Lance Wilson in the presence of his attorney, interviewed over 30 uh, either present or former Payne Weber employees, and reviewed over 20 boxes of internal corporate documents representing well over 10,000 pages of material. We also filed a Freedom of Information Act request with HUD, HUD and obtained some documents from them. Mr. Wilson began working at Payne Weber on March 31, 1988, at that time, he had been out of HUD for approximately... You mean 86? Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> At that time, March 31, 1986, he had been out of HUD for approximately uh, two years. Mr. Wilson presently holds the title First Vice President within Payne Weber and is one of 185 people who hold that title. 200 or so other officers... Could I ask, what are the higher level titles than that? Um, other than your two titles? Sure. Uh, the director of the division, the deputy director of the division, a managing director, senior vice president, executive vice president, president, chairman. Uh, vice chairman. Vice chairman. So about how many people in the Payne Weber hierarchy are at ranks above Mr. Wilson? Uh, that was my next, next comment. Oh, please go ahead. Uh, approximately 200 are above him. Are above him. And about 186 at the same level? 85, 185 is the at number the we have at the same Thank level. You. Yes, sir. Mr. Wilson's primary duties at, at Payne Weber <coughs> have involved new business development in the public finance area. <coughs> he has never had any supervisory responsibilities while at Payne Weber. In our interview with him, he stated that he had spent approximately 10% of his time on HUD-related matters and 90% of his time on non-HUD related matters. The non-HUD matters are listed in detail in our full length submission and involved work on over 20 financings for states and state and local authorities in the aggregate face amount of approximately $2 billion. In our interview and in our review of documents, we found nothing inconsistent with Mr. Wilson's statement concerning the allocation of his time. In May 1988, Payne Weber was selected to act, act as a financial advisor to HUD with respect to certain asset dispositions. This selection followed a public open competitive bidding process. The Payne Weber employee principally responsible for this project was Henry Edelman, then a first vice president of Payne Weber and presently president of the Federal Agricultural Mortgage Corporation. The law firm of Donalds, Duvall, Porter, and Bennett also provided substantial assistance. Mr. Edelman sought limited advice from Mr. Wilson on this matter and asked Mr. Wilson to review and comment on the final proposal. Mr. Edelman has also advised us that he believes that after the proposal was submitted, Mr. Wilson spoke with HUD personnel, principally Mr. Schoenberger, concerning the general status of the proposal. Mr. Edelman also advised us that he did not request Mr. Wilson to do so, 
and that Mr. Wilson also never indicated to him that he had any special ability to undo the maze of bureaucracy at HUD. We obtained, through a Freedom of Information Act request to HUD, a memorandum of Carl Kovitz, Under Secretary of HUD, selecting Payne Weber to be the financial advisor to HUD. This memorandum included numerous laudatory comments about Payne Weber, concluding that Mr. Kovitz had selected Payne Weber to act as HUD's financial advisor based upon its ability to combine a vast knowledge of HUD programs with its marketing expertise and organizational strengths. He also stated, and this is quoting from the, his memo, I agree with the boards, that's the source evaluation board's conclusion, that each of the competing applicants is well qualified. I have not selected Chemical Bank, largely due to its relative lack of HUD-related experience. I have not selected Kidder Peabody, largely due to its relative lack of organizational skills, and also because of concerns I share with the board related to due diligence and cost issues. As directed by separate work orders, Payne Weber subsequently acted as the financial advisor to HUD on three asset dispositions. Payne Weber billed and was paid $395,000 for acting in connection with the first transaction. Payne Weber in turn paid $145,000 of that amount to law and accounting firms representing Payne Weber as our professional advisors. On August 7, 1989, Payne Weber billed HUD $146,000 for work on the second transaction and $276,000 for work on the third transaction. On those two transactions, Payne Weber owes fees to its outside professional advisors in the amount of $155,000. We have not yet been paid for our work on these last two projects, so in summary, we have received net gross fees of $255,000 and owe $155,000 presently to our uh, outside uh, advisors. I would note that uh, two evaluation forms which were attached to Mr. Kovitz's memorandum had some nice things to say about Payne Weber's work uh, as financial advisor, including the sale of the PFL, that's a reference to public facility loans, was completed more quickly than any other securitized federal asset sale. The level of proceeds was higher than those from the sister program and the costs were less. Payne Weber's cost slash fees were substantially lower than projected and Payne Weber's assistance in keeping costs down and maximizing proceeds was exemplary. In our interview and in the review of documents, we did not find any evidence that Mr. Wilson had improperly influenced the selection process or that there was any other impropriety in connection with this contract. In particular, we placed great weight on Mr. Kovitz's report, which indicates that he made his decision solely on the basis of his evaluation of the merits of each competitor. And we found no evidence of any communications between Mr. Wilson and Mr. Kovitz on this particular contract. At the time Mr. Wilson joined Payne Weber, one of our then subsidiaries was applying to become a HUD approved co-insurer. Um, these applications were filed shortly after Mr. Wilson joined Payne Weber. At the request of Raymond Reiser, president of this subsidiary, Mr. Wilson reviewed and commented on the various applications but played no substantive role in the preparation of either application. Subsequent to the filing, Mr. Wilson called HUD to inquire about the general status of these applications and attended various meetings with Mr. Reiser at HUD to discuss the application. Mr. Reiser has advised us in our interview with him that he never asked Mr. Wilson to seek any special consideration and that as far as he knows, Mr. Wilson had no impact on the approval. Mr. Reiser and Mr. Wilson also have advised us that they met on occasions with various HUD officials concerning a concept for refinancing outstanding HUD guaranteed hospital bond issues. We understand that other members of the financial community also met with HUD officials on this topic and that HUD ultimately approved a general concept which allowed such refinancings. In our questioning of Mr. Reiser and Mr. Wilson, we found nothing which caused us to conclude that any impropriety had occurred in this area. 
On May 20, 1988, Payne Weber act is, acted as the sole underwriter of approximately $215 million of bonds issued by the Arkansas Development Finance Authority. This transaction involved the purchase by ADFA from Jenny May of $389 million of face amount loans owned by Jenny May bearing below market interest rates. As our underwriting fee, Payne Weber received a fee of $4.2 million from ADFA. This fee, along with the subsequent brokerage fee for locating a servicer or the underlying mortgage notes, was negotiated on an arm's length basis with ADFA. Mr. Wilson was one of four lead members of municipal finance professionals who worked on this transaction. As such, he was involved in various meetings with representatives of ADFA and in meetings among representatives of ADFA, Jenny May, and Payne Weber. Jenny May was fully aware of all details concerning this transaction, specifically including the fee paid to Payne Weber for underwriting the bonds. Particularly in light of the arm's length negotiations surrounding all aspects of this transaction and the fact that all parties to the transaction, including HUD and Jenny May, were represented by counsel at all times, we found no impropriety in connection with this transaction. In our full length submission, we referred to something known as the Section 108 Loan Program and an entity known as Payne Weber Insured Mortgage Partners. These two matters involve some contact between Payne Weber and HUD, but Mr. Wilson's involvement was minimal and indicated no impropriety. The media has focused on Lance Wilson's involvement in efforts by Fannie Mae to obtain approval from Secretary Pierce to sponsor financing vehicles known as REMIX. In 1987, private issuers could sponsor REMIX, but Fannie Mae lacked this authority. Mr. Wilson advised us that David Maxwell, chairman of Fannie Mae, requested Mr. Wilson's assistance in urging Secretary Pierce to grant REMIC authority to Fannie Mae. Mr. Wilson has advised us that he subsequently met with Secretary Pierce to urge that Fannie Mae, in fact, be allowed to sponsor REMIX. We understand that numerous people arguing both sides of this uh, particular issue attended meetings and had discussions with Secretary Pierce on this issue, which was a matter of public debate. Secretary Pierce subsequently granted REMIC authority to Fannie Mae. Um, particularly in light of the public attention on this matter, the fact that it was a broad policy issue, the number of parties that apparently urged Secretary Pierce to act on this matter, both pro and con, and the information we developed we found no basis for concluding that any impropriety had occurred. When Mr. Wilson joined Payne Weber, he already owned a 15% interest in a project referred to by various names, including the name Wedgwood Plaza. Payne Weber subsequently acted as the third of three co-managing underwriters for $15.8 million of revenue bonds issued by the Housing Finance Authority of Palm Beach County, Florida. William R. Huff & Co. was the lead or book running manager. In our interview with Mr. Wilson concerning this project, he advised us that his interest was received for legal and consulting services he performed for the project's developer, one Leonard Briscoe, prior to the time Wilson joined Payne Weber. That New York City Housing Development Corporation regulations allowed Mr. Wilson as president of HDC to consult on non-HDC projects. That he has received tax benefits, but no cash distributions from this particular project. And we found no evidence uh, which contradicted the foregoing statements. In connection with this particular project, the subcommittee staff also posed one additional question. How often does Payne Weber act as an underwriter for such a project in which an officer has an interest. Such an occurrence within Payne Weber is at best rare. The decision to act as an underwriter in such a situation would be made on an ad hoc basis by the individual or individuals with the authority to commit Payne Weber to the underwriting, a process and authority that varies from department to department. In this instance, the decision to act as an underwriter was made by Lee Barba, then head of the Municipal Securities Group, Mr. Wilson's interest was fully disclosed 
in the offering document as required by the federal securities laws. In our full length submission, we noted that Mr. Wilson has entertained various HUD officials from time to time. We questioned Mr. Wilson and his attorney about these expenses. Mr. Wilson has steadfastly maintained that he did not make the expenditures in an effort to obtain political or business favors or to improperly influence any official and that he believes these expenditures complied with HUD's entertainment regulations. Other Payne Weber personnel who have been interviewed concerning Wilson's expense reports have no independent recollection of the circumstances set forth in Mr. Wilson's expense reports. We have not contacted the various HUD personnel identified in these expense reports, but quite frankly, seriously doubt that they would be willing to talk to us about them. While we may have reservations in this area, unfortunately, without additional information from the entertained persons we are in the position of being unable to reach a firm conclusion as to the propriety or impropriety of these expenditures. We asked Mr. Wilson if he what, would be... What would be those reservations, may I ask, you referring to? The uh, reservations are that, that we simply don't have enough information. We can't check what Mr. Wilson has, has told us about the expense accounts, that they're um, that they were personal, that it was not in exchange for any official decision or favoritism. He has told us that. But if they're personal, why would Payne Weber pay for them? Uh, the decision to approve travel and uh, expense accounts within our organization rests within the department or sub-department. We do have that, that's in, uh, in reference to a specific submission. We do have a general policy statement on expense accounts which says, just bear with me for, for a moment. It is the responsibility of all employees submitting employee business expense reports to record only those expenses which have been incurred for the benefit of the company and are in accordance with company policy. And this now, seems to me to contradict Mr. Wilson's claimed statement to you that these were personal expenditures. And if they were personal, they should not have been submitted to Payne Weber for reimbursement. And if in fact they were submitted to Payne Weber for reimbursement as they were, then they could not have been personal, but related to Payne Weber's business. If these were personal... Which is what Mr. Wilson claimed to you that they were. He has said that they were motivated in part by personal friendship. Well, now, is it company policy at Payne Weber to reimburse employees for expenses motivated in part by personal friendship. That appears to be stretching our rule, Mr. Chairman. Well, I am not submitting no. expense accounts to you, Ms. Treadway. Mr. Wilson submitted expense accounts to you, and you are testifying under oath that he no. claimed that these were not business-related but personal. He's My logical next question is, does Payne Weber reimburse its employees for personal expenditures? No. You do not? Our policy is that we do not. I would expect your policy to be that. Did you therefore ask him to refund these expenditures that he claimed were personal but initially submitted to Payne Weber for reimbursement? Not yet. <laughs> I'm not trying to avoid your question. I, we, we know we have not asked him. Why? Because we wanted to see what Mr. Wilson would testify to. We wanted to see what additional facts would, would, uh, would come out in the, in the course of the last couple of days of, of witnesses ap appearing. So we hopefully would have, have more information, more hard information. Okay. Well, uh, you have followed the events of the last couple of days in this subcommittee. You are aware that Mr. Wilson 
took the Fifth Amendment, which is of course his privilege and prerogative, but we had an extended discussion uh, in the subcommittee because of the attempts at uh, uh, confusing the nature of this uh, plea, the Fifth Amendment plea, and uh, several members of the subcommittee, including myself, pointed out to Mr. Wilson and his attorney that the Fifth Amendment can legitimately be claimed only if the individual invoking his Fifth Amendment privilege genuinely believes that he is in danger of self-incrimination. Uh, they clearly understood this. I suspect they knew it before they came before the subcommittee, but it was certainly made clear to them. So that's where we are now. Mr. Wilson has refused to testify. My question then is, in view of his statement to you, that these expenditures which he submitted to you for reimbursement, or I suspect he used his Payne Weber credit card and just submitted the receipts. I don't know what your company policy is on that. Is it now your intention to request Mr. Wilson to reimburse Payne Weber for all expenditures that he claims were personal in nature? The answer to that is yes. Would you be so kind to come a little oh, closer? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. The answer to that is to the extent that they are personal Yes, we in intend to seek reimbursement. Well, I am not claiming that they're personal. You testified five minutes ago that Wilson claimed they were personal. And to the extent he said they're personal, then he has submitted an expense account that should, he should not have submitted and should not have been approved. And therefore, yes, we will seek reimbursement. You will seek reimbursement. Please go ahead. I didn't no, want to interrupt sorry. you, but this was a logical point to ask this question. No, can I just add one, one, one comment on, on this? Is, is that uh, in, in terms of, of testing what Mr. Wilson said, it would have been, our point was it would have been very nice and very helpful if we had been able to question the people who were entertained. That was the point of cross-checking that I, I was trying to make. But we simply, um, we did not attempt to contact the HUDA pe people, but we really didn't think they would talk to us. Yeah, but if I may on. pursue that for a minute, if Wilson claims to you that these expenditures were personal, should it not have been the responsibility of whoever reviews his expense statements, and by now they have gone up quite high, I suspect, to request the reimbursement on the basis of his claim? If there were pers if, if there are personal expenses, they should not have been approved. I'm sorry, I can't hear if you. If they were personal expenses, they should not have been approved by his superior who was reviewing the travel and expense accounts. Or now, they should never have been submitted if or in never fact they were personal. Or maybe they were not personal, they were business. And since they, their business character would now create problems, Mr. Wilson might now claim that they were personal when in fact they were not personal. Is that another option? Uh, in the realm of options that might be out there, I would, that's certainly there. Sure. Well, I can't think of any others. Yeah. I can only think of two. The expenditures were either business or they were personal. If they were business, Wilson properly submitted them. He was reimbursed for them. But these were incurred on behalf of his conducting business for Payne Weber, I trust, uh, with HUB or they were personal, in which case he should not have submitted them. And when you or whoever questioned him about these and he claimed that they were personal, I would suspect, had I been in Payne Weber's boots, I would have said, if, if these are personal, then you'd better pay for them yourself. Am I correct? That's a very good observation. I, I, well, I, I appreciate agree. your commendation. My question is really whether I'm correct in my yeah. analysis. Yes. Okay. I, th I thought we had agreed with that earlier. Okay. Well, okay. What, we, what we don't agree on, Mr. Treadway, is your failure to request reimbursement on the basis of his claim that these were personal expenditures and your admitted inability to interview HUD employees. So all you can, all you can go on is to take his word. 
And if he claims these are personal expenditures, since you are a guardian of Payne Weber's finances, you would then say, well, if these expenditures are personal, you better pay for them yourself. Wouldn't that have been a better procedure? In hindsight, yes. Okay. Uh, we will be in a brief recess until we cast our votes and then return. Subcommittee will resume. Um, I'd like to ask Mr. Treadway to continue with your opening statement. Um, uh, yes, sir. Um, I think I was to the... Uh, to the point of, of beginning to talk about our request as to whether Mr. Wilson could make, it's not coming clear, our request as to whether he could um, provide us with certain general broad representations which we, we discussed with him and, and his attorney. And uh, along with his, uh, his attorney uh, listening in, he, was, he did give us several general representations which we've referred to in our full-length testimony as follows, that he never received from HUD any non-public document or documents he thought or were, was told were non-public, that neither he nor Payne Weber received any favoritism from any HUD official, that he never sought to improperly influence the decision-making process at HUD, that he never gave anything of value to any HUD official in connection with the performance of their official duties or to influence their decisions on any official matter and that he believes that in his dealings with HUD he complied with all laws, rules, regulations and always acted properly in all of his and our company's dealings with HUD. In conclusion, uh, Mr. Chairman, it's abundantly clear that pa Lance Wilson while employed by Payne Weber, has had various contacts, both business and social, with various HUD officials. It's also abundantly clear that in his appearances at HUD on behalf of Payne Weber, he advocated Payne Weber's position on various matters. In short, Mr. Wilson was familiar with HUD's programs, its processes, and had access to various HUD officials. However, we have not been able to find that concrete piece of evidence that we could point to that demonstrated a quid pro quo on a specific transaction. And if we had found that, that would have caused us to reach a different conclusion from the one that we have uh, generally uh, reported. Uh, obviously, we also recognize that the line between proper access and improper influence can be a fine line, and it sometimes can be a very fuzzy line. But as I said, we have not found that one piece of concrete information that allows us, um, trying to be as objective as possible, to conclude there, that there was a quid pro quo uh, that would have been improper in any of Mr. Wilson's dealings with HUD. As I said, that's a very quick summary of a very uh, uh, much lengthier statement that we, we submitted, and obviously I've omitted substantial portions of it, but we would be delighted to answer any questions that we can. And as Mr. Marin said uh, earlier, if um, uh, there uh, is information that this subcommittee would like beyond that which we are able to provide today, I assure you that we will provide the information. If you wish us to come back and testify, we will come back and testify. We will meet with the subcommittee staff, whatever you request. Well, thank you very much, both of you gentlemen. Let me just state for the record that in the chairman's view, the cooperation we received from Payne Weber has been exemplary, and I want to thank you for that, and I want to thank you for your testimony. I have a, a number of questions that I would like to, to raise with both of you. I read with great care your full report, and uh, while I suspect it's uh, all right as far as it goes, I didn't think it was very analytical because overwhelmingly it relied uh, on Mr. Wilson's own, in many instances, self-serving statements. 
But there are a few areas um, where I felt uh, uh, that uh, perhaps more could have been done. So let me direct you to your full statement, sure. if I may. And sure. on page one, the bottom paragraph, you say, Mr. Wilson declined to provide his tax return and personal financial or investment data. Uh, now that clearly, um, you know, is, is an individual's privilege, uh, but under the circumstances, uh, uh, I am wondering whether you felt any concern about this. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, we asked for Particularly that. in view of the fact, if I may interrupt you for Chairman. a second, uh, uh, that, that Payne Weber is a major and highly respected entity in a regulated industry. Yes, sir. Um, uh, the answer is, is yes. It, it, it does, uh, did and, and does give us um, cer certainly pause. We asked uh, about this on several occasions. Uh, and were persistently advised by Mr. Wilson and his attorney that um, these are my words, not theirs, because I can't recall the exact words, sure. but essentially that his private investments and his tax information is private information. Uh, it has nothing to do with Payne Weber, and therefore we decline to provide it to you. And we reiterated the request. Uh, and we received the same response. Um, would we like to have had access to it? Yes, but again, I don't know how we could get it at that point. Well, uh, since he works for you, can get it in any number of ways if you feel that it's important for you to get it. I will uh, <clears throat> ask staff to show you two checks received by Mr. Wilson. Um, both of these, uh, both of these, uh, while being a, presumably a full-time employee of Payne Weber, and both of these, uh, as I understand your uh, company policies, in clear violation of company policy. I suspect you may have been listening to the earlier testimony of individuals. I don't know if you were near a television set. Um, we, we just had the gentleman testify that uh, uh, he hired uh, Mr. Wilson uh, to, uh, I think I'm quoting him, to take care of a problem with Hunter Cushing, who was a, who was a Deputy mm -hmm. Assistant Secretary for Housing, for a project that this individual had. and. Uh, $10,000 payment was made to Mr. Wilson, as I understand it. And um, uh, within a day or so, he reported that Hunter Cushing won't give this project any difficulties. So presumably, this was a telephone call or a brief personal meeting. I think it was a meeting because, according to the, to the expense records, Payne Weber paid for that dinner uh, that was uh, had between Mr. Cushing and, and, and Mr. Wilson just about that time of, uh, of, uh, of the year. You obviously no reason to know about this, but uh, th 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 those are the facts reflected in the expense statements. Now, I would think that if it is one of your company policies, uh, Mr. Meron, not to have your employees engage in consulting activity while on your payroll, then it is not unreasonable for you to request uh, income tax information. Isn't that true? Well, it is our policy. Um, I don't think that we've ever been able to enforce getting income tax information from an employee. I agree okay. with you that a request would be helpful, but we have no power to enforce that. I understand that. I understand yeah. that. Uh, what is your intention now? Uh, in view of uh, clear violation of your policy by an employee, a high, highly placed employee. Okay. May I ask a, a, a question, uh, Mr. Chairman? Are, are these checks related to that Hunter Cushing telephone call you were talking about, or is this separate? No, one of them relates to, 
to that project, am I correct? And the other, to, uh, the $10,000 relates to... Uh, we had testimony from an individual just before you gentlemen came on, who indicated that uh, he had a, a major project at HUD, that he got word that Mr. Hunter Cushing is unlikely to approve it, although technically and in every other sense it was all right. And he knew of uh, Mr. Wilson's influence at HUD and relationships at HUD, asked him if he would uh, help him and uh, paid him $10,000 for that. Okay. Well, um, uh, I, I This comes as a surprise to you. No, I no, it, it, not a total surprise because we've heard, heard, heard rumors in, in the press about, about this question of outside, outside consulting. Um, we have asked Mr. Wilson about outside consulting. He has told us he didn't do any. At the end of 1988, he signed a representation, a written representation to Payne Weber this, in which he says that he has complied with all Payne Weber policies, procedures, guidelines, directives, and so forth, which clearly would include the prohibition on outside consulting work without specific approval. Furthermore, that um, um, prohibition is a subject of numerous directives fairly regularly sent out. And in fact, uh, this is not referred to in, in, in this statement, but I also, uh, we have uh, discovered that when um, he came with Payne Weber or some short, short period of time thereafter, he received a statement of policies from the Fixed Income Division of which the Municipal Securities Group was a statement, which also um, put him on notice and, and he confirms that he was aware of the restriction. He has advised us he didn't do outside consulting work. Now, you have evidence that he has done outside consulting work. Well, uh, we have sworn testimony to that effect. Sworn testimony, evidence. Yes. Uh, that, assuming that's all, all true, and then you say it's sworn testimony, that would be a clear and unequivocal violation of our policies and procedures and one that we take very seriously. And when uh, an employee violates our policies and procedures, and we can prove it, rather than being arbitrary or operating on the basis of a suspicion, sure. then we have a number of options. <clears throat> we can suspend without pay. We can reduce their rank in the company, demote them in effect. We can terminate them. And if there are uh, instances where the violative conduct has resulted in monetary damage to Payne Weber, we would consider whether a lawsuit would be appropriate. And in fact, in times past, we have initiated lawsuits against employees who have caused monetary damage to Payne Weber. Well, you understand, of course, that your presence here today is directly related to our inability to obtain testimony from Mr. Wilson directly. I, um, yes, sir, we do understand that. There was, uh, there was no plan on the part of this subcommittee to ask uh, uh, either Mr. Meron or you to testify prior to our being advised by, by Mr. Uh, Wilson's attorney that he will not testify. This way we have no option but to go around him and to work with people who, who have dealings with him yes. such as his employer. Mr. No, Mr. Chairman, we, we understand that and, and I assure you we don't resent the process at all. Well, we, we, we appreciate that. Well, let me ask a question about his, his salary history, which I find interesting. Mm -hmm. I realize that your bonus is paid the following year. I mean, if, I, if an employee gets a bonus for year one, he gets it in year two. But combining the salary and the bonus, uh, the information I, I, I believe your office supplied us shows him in 1986 with an income of 150000 in 87 with an income of 240,000 and in 1988 with an income of 325,000 is that correct uh, yes sir that that's correct now uh, is it has this been the general pattern of the 185 people in your um, uh, business at the rank that Mr. Wilson holds of uh, more than doubling their salary in a two-year period? 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have to tell you that we have not uh, done an, a, a spreadsheet comparison like that. Um, but is it the ballpark? So I mean, but the, the most of these people who made 150,000 in 86 that's nine, nine, got went to it, 325? Uh, from 86 to 87 were uh, good years. 88 was not a spectacular year. It, it is conceivable that you would see a similar progression uh, on the part of those who remain. But I, I, I'm really getting to the realm of speculation. No, I'm not that, asking you for a statistical numbers, answer. Yeah, you know, it, it doesn't jump out. I, I would. I might just offer a couple of other Please. comments on, on his uh, salary. That if you look at the, uh, the average over the three-year period of time, he would be about midpoint on average um, of, of his peers in that particular group. Compared against investment bankers overall, it would be um, substantially, substantially below the average substantially below the average. Uh, compared to investment bankers overall, mm -hmm. yes. So what you are testifying to is you have about 200 people above his rank. In title. In t but not necessarily in salary. I can, I can answer that even more specifically. Uh, I, I asked uh, if we could check a computer run mm -hmm. for 1988, and it shows that Mr. Wilson would have ranked approximately 560th in compensation among Payne Weber employees. What you are saying is that earning $325,000 put him 560 in rank order. That's the 560 is, is could be 558, 562. Thereabouts. The answer is you yes. have a lot of applicants so <laughs> by, the time, by the time these hearings are, by, by the time these hearings are over. Now, uh, You really hired Mr. Wilson, who really didn't have much investment banking experience. Basically, Mr. Meron, and I'd like you to answer that if you would, uh, because of his HUD relationships. Is that correct? <coughs> HUD experience. Well, as you know from our testimony, Mr. Uh, Wilson was hired by several people in the organization, one of whom is no longer with the firm. Yes. And, um, but I assume... That's Mr. Barba. That's right. Yes. I assume that they hired him because of a combination of factors. Yes. Um, he's a lawyer uh, from what I'm told is a good law school. Uh, he had very good references from a number of organizations, including the Equitable. He had um, experience after he left HUD in a, another housing-related activity in New York. Uh, and he was seen as someone who was knowledgeable in a broad range of things. I think it's clear that his experience in HUD and his understanding of the regulations and how to deal with what I guess everybody agrees is a very complex bureaucracy would undoubtedly have entered into it in terms of the people who hired him. But I think it's the combination, the package of activities and the very good references which he had, which Mr. Treadway has submitted, uh, that would have been the result, that, that would have resulted in his being hired. Right. Now, uh, one of his jobs, perhaps his most important job, was to deal with HUD and HUD-related items. Would that be accurate? I would say that his job was to work on various uh, financing opportunities across a, a wide range of activities. Um, one of those clients was HUD. I think, as Mr. Treadway uh, said earlier, approximately 10 percent of Mr. Wilson's time, at least as represented by Mr. Wilson, was spent on, on HUD activities. I have no uh, personal knowledge whether that's exactly right or not. But he worked on a, a number of different financings, and I think we have submitted some of them, Jim, haven't we? Have I said there, there, there was a, there is a list, uh, Mr. Chairman, in our uh, submission yes, of I, some I 20 or so yeah. scattered across the country, about $2 billion. Uh, in, in financing, so that's on pages uh, seven, eight, seven and eight, essentially, of the full, full version of, of my submission. Okay, so I, I can satisfy this point. His immediate supervisor, Mr. Lee K. Barba, 
left your company in July of 89, is that correct? Yes, sir. Was that departure in any way related to the ongoing investigation? Not that we are aware of, Mr. Chairman. Uh, was it related in any way to Mr. Wilson? Not that we are aware of. Our understanding is Mr. Uh, Mr. Barba had a business opportunity at uh, another financial in institution uh, which seemed attractive to him and he decided to pursue that. We have uh, received no indication from Mr. Barb at the time he left that there was anything else involved. Well, the thing that intrigues me is that I suspect in the investment banking field as in most other professional fields, uh, even though you leave a company, you ideally maintain cordial and ongoing pleasant relationships because it's a relatively small fraternity or sorority. Um, I suspect uh, it's puzzling that Mr. Barba declined to be interviewed by you concerning Lance Wilson. Now, I would uh, wonder if, Mr. Maron, you would care to speculate as to the reasons. I really can't speculate. I don't know. I know that... Well, did, did you ask? Did anybody from Payne... Well, you did? Yeah. Go ahead. I asked, uh, um, I think Mr. Gunther, uh, who's one of our senior officers, spoke to Mr. Barba directly. Uh, I called Mr. Mr. Barba to uh, ask if he would uh, meet with us, and I, I'm, I may be going a little bit, I'm not sure, uh, a little speculation here, but but uh, he simply told us through a representative, a gentleman who is a general counsel for Bankers Trust Company, that he saw no, um, nothing, uh, that he didn't think anything would be accomplished by um, our asking him specific questions. He gave us, through this gentleman, a general assurance that he knew of nothing. His term was untoward, was the word that the gentleman kept using, concerning uh, anything at Payne Weber, at HUD, involving Lance Wilson. We did attempt um, to persuade uh, this gentleman, who was um, acting as Mr. Barber's spokesman, that it would be helpful, it would be useful for everyone if we could ask specific questions in a number of areas. But he simply kept reiterating to me that Mr. Barber was off on a new career. He was a busy man. Uh, we've told you everything we know, and specific questions won't add anything to it. That's what we encountered when we attempted to chat with him, to interview him. I'd like to ask a few questions concerning some expenses paid for by Payne Weber. By the way, in terms of, of uh, fringe benefits and perquisites, what additional fringe benefits and perquisites does an individual at that level receive at Payne Weber? Uh, they have n no perks, as, as that, that term is commonly uh, understood. Um, on, on the um, uh, pension and retirement benefits. I, I must say I didn't focus on that when that question was asked of me. There are guidelines if you've been an employee for a certain year. It's a non-discriminatory broad pension plan based on years of service and uh, your, your compensation level. And I can't think of anything else that would, would so be... So all you have is an expense account on top of the salary? That, that's correct, sir. But let me deal with that yeah. for a minute. There is one item, well there are many items that that give me pause, but there is one that I find remarkable. Uh, there is a, an expense report submitted which says that he hosted a dinner party given by D. Dean, assistant to the secretary of HUD, or 14 people for dinner at a cost of $1,089.45. Now, uh, please explain to me 
the propriety of, I take it, Miss Deborah Dean giving a dinner party for 14 people for which Payne Weber picks up the tab. I'll send down the, uh, please uh, provide the gentleman with the voucher. That's the third item yeah, on the yeah, list. Yeah, yes, Mr. Yeah. Um, may I, before I do that, just just ask the gentleman right behind me who worked on, on this investigation. Of course. Me, who's looked of course. Questions. Just clarify course. something. Is that? Please do. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm sorry sorry for the delay. I wanted no, to... No, no, just take, to, take time. To, to, I mean, uh, I would be puzzled if somebody asked me to answer. That. Well, I wanted <laughs> to be sure that, that I um, uh, quoted uh, Mr. Wilson's uh, statement back to us correctly. His statement when asked about this was that he did not recall the purpose of this dinner. When we asked... An $1,100 dinner? $1,100 dinner? Um, I will say it again. His statement was that he did not recall the purpose of this dinner. Did I say it correctly? Well, okay. Go on. Um, the individual who approved this expenditure but of course, I'm not asking necessarily about the purpose of the dinner. I'm asking about the fundamental apparent peculiarity of Miss Dean, who at that time is still assistant to Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, gives a dinner which is paid for by Lance Wilson and charged to Payne Weber. I Yes, Mr. Chair, and I, I hadn't lost sight of that question. I, I, that's what I was, I was coming okay, to. Okay, I always help you. Okay, that's all right, that's all right. <laughs> uh, what I was going to say is that uh, Mr. Wilson has said what I've said twice. The gentleman who approved his expense account is on that item, is no longer with Payne Weber, and won't talk I, to I'm us. I'm not surprised, I'm not surprised. And won't talk to us, and if your question is, does it look peculiar, the answer is yes. Have you asked Wilson? We asked him why. Answer, I don't recall the purpose of this. But my question is not just about the purpose, but about the structure of it. I mean, you understand what I'm asking. Well, I, I, I mean, why should Payne Weber pay for a dinner hosted by the assistant the executive assistant to the secretary of HUD. Mr. Chairman, we have the same question. Uh, I, I, as I say, Mr. Wilson simply has one statement on this, which and I, and I've said it all already two, two or three times. Uh, and that's all we have from him on this particular item. I fully okay. agree that we don't like it. It looks odd. Yeah, you didn't ask him to reimburse you. We have not asked for reimbursement on anything yet, no sir. And 
Do you intend to in on, the near future? On, on, on those that are personal, which on the surface this appears to be, and we will ask again for his explanation. All right. We will pursue it. Okay. I want to show you another voucher, if sure. I may. Uh, staff will please provide it to the gentleman. Apparently, Payne Weber paid $259.80 uh, to repair a ring of a lady who damaged it while bowling at Phil's client party. I don't know who Phil is, unless it's uh, Phil Wynn, uh, of formerly of HUD. Yeah. Um. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, first of all, I, I'm going to start out by saying this looks like an odd expenditure or two. Uh, well, I mean, if I a lady but, but, damages her ring, I have enormous empathy for yeah. her. Uh, but I do not understand why Payne Weber stands ready to reimburse the lady. Well, uh, I do have a couple of pieces of information that are not going to totally answer the question, but might clarify a little, little bit here. Uh, my copy is not clear on the bottom line, and, and but I think it says PW client party. Uh, the, the, the original version that I saw, not Phil, and the explanation that we have is that PW stands for Payne Weber I see. client party, not okay. Philip Wynn. Okay, that, that, that is helpful. That's helpful. And this... Um, a uh, young lady uh, who is, at, uh, is an employee or was an employee at the time of the um, Housing Development Corporation in New York. It was a Payne Weber bowling, bowling party. Her husband is a, an employee of Payne Weber. He's a bond trader. Um, as I say, that simply, I think, closes the loop on the factual circumstances. Having said all of that, I still agree. It's an odd expenditure. I don't know why this would have been approved. Please. Um, is, is Lee Barber, Barba, the same individual who would have approved this? Uh, it, let me find out. Can I ask about this sure, one specifically? Sure, because sure, sure. it's not Lee Barba in all instances. There were other people from time to well, time. Well, let, let me, you know, let me just cut through that yeah, then. That, uh, it, when did Mr. Uh, when did you put Sam, uh, when did Lance Wilson go on leave of absence? Uh, August, uh, late late August, um, August twenty fourth or so. Okay. Uh, when, when did when did you convince? When did you begin your investigation? Uh, we started it um, a week or so earlier. We started a week earlier. About ten days earlier. So um, the last part of July. Well, that would be uh, early, early August, 14th of Am August. Am I to draw any conclusion from the fact that uh, Lee Barba, Barba left um, in July of 1989 when you began your investigation? He left before we began it. Uh, he did left. he leave when there was controversy about Lance <coughs> Wilson? Uh, my recollection, Mr. Shays, is that he left around the first week in, in July. Um, Will you begin? At, I'm sorry. No, we had not begun an investigation at that point in time. Had you begun at, to ask questions about Lance Wilson? No, no sir, I had not. Quite frankly, uh, we, I had seen the name in, in the paper. Uh, we knew that he had uh, been subpoenaed to appear on, I believe, the 28th. Of, of July, but um, we had not started an internal investigation at that point. Now, now Lance Wilson is on paid leave? Uh, it's, it's called uh, temporary leave with pay or administrative leave with pay. That's correct. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to show you a, a letter on Payne Weber stationery signed by Lance w Wilson first Vice President to HUD, which I would like to uh, read and have it placed. You have a copy? Yeah, I have one. Thank you. You have a copy with you. 
this, uh, this, this is a remarkable letter that I'm sure, I very much hope you gentlemen will be able to explain to me. Uh, did, did Lance Wilson, this letter reads, it's to Honorable Du Bois Gilliam, Deputy Assistant Secretary at HUD. It relates to the Briscoe project in which Wilson himself has a 15% equity interest. And it says, Dear Mr. Gilliam, Payne Weber is pleased to issue its firm commitment, etc., to underwrite taxable bonds in the amount of 79 million, etc. The undersigned has authority to issue this commitment on behalf of Payne Weber. Is that accurate? Um, that's the first time I've seen those documents, and I'm just checking right now. I don't think we've, we've located those documents. Um, I do know... Well, he is making a loan to himself, isn't he? Th and this was never done. This was never completed. No financing ever occurred. Well, maybe so, but I mean, he, he is making the commitment. He wrote the letter and said, I'm making a commitment. I don't think it he was accepted to by, so. by, uh, <clears throat> by the developer. Yeah, he doesn't have the authority to make that commitment. Well, what do you do when an employee makes a $79 million, $860,000 commitment on your behalf on Payne Weber stationery, who signs his name and says the undersigned has authority to issue this commitment on behalf of Payne Weber, and it's a commitment on a project where he is the 15% equity owner? Um. Do you have a copy also, Ms. Maron? I don't. No. no. We, we, will, have, we, we have several pieces. Give you a copy. I think That's it's okay. We, we actually have several pieces oh, of paper very she good. gave us. She gave us four separate ones. Please. Oh, wait a minute. We have two of those. Keep I think you away. should take time, gentlemen, to read it. I don't want to rush. Yeah. This is Jim. I already have one of these. Yeah. All right. Let me start comment on it. Um, Mr. Chairman, yes. um, the person who would have had authority to make such a commitment at this point in time would have been Mr. Barba, not Mr. Wilson, in, in that particular group. So I cannot tell you why. Um, Mr. Bar, uh, Mr. Uh, Wilson wrote such a letter, but now I'm 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 confused. Are you reading from November 25? I'm sorry. November 25, 1986, reference Overton Ridge development. That's that's the first letter that I. Uh, uh, oh, then uh, I that is a second letter, January 21 letter. Okay, fine. No, let, just, I just want to make sure Let's we're on the same. Let's deal with the November 25 letter. Okay. Uh, I, I, don't I, am, I am very sorry to bring such painful information to, to the attention of uh, well. you gentlemen, but I think it's, it's remarkable that this is the first time you're looking at this, because what, this, what you are testifying to under oath, and I have no doubt accurately, is that Mr. Wilson had no authority to issue a commitment on behalf of Payne Weber in the amount of $79,860,000, but apparently he did. And he not only issued that commitment, but he issued it with himself a partial beneficiary, 15% equity beneficiary. It, it, he is a 15% owner in Overton Ridge? That is our understanding. Uh. I'm not sure I know that one way or the other, but can I just, again, I want to double check? check yeah, I, I, I'm not challenging. No, no, I, as I, I just understand. Question. Do we have any knowledge of that? We know about a 15% interest in Wedgwood. Uh, well, yeah, let's, let's forget the 15% interest. 
I may be confusing the two properties. Uh, let me just deal with the, with the authority to make this commitment. The authority to make such a commitment would have resided in Mr. Barba, who was then head of the Municipal <coughs> Securities Group, not in Mr. Wilson personally. Now, the only thing I can uh, add as possible uh, observation on it is uh, I suppose it's possible that Mr. Barba verbally authorized Mr. Wilson to do it, but I don't n know that to be the case. I don't know the circumstances of the issuance of this letter. I, I certainly believe that. My question is, does a department have, ha, does he have the authority unilaterally to pass on his authority to people working under him? Yes, as a general rule, if he de delegates or designates uh, someone to do it, that, that would be an appropriate, that would comply with accepted procedures in the firm, yes. So you will now inquire of Mr. Barba as to whether, in fact, he has done that? Uh, we will be delighted to put the question to Mr. Barba. And if uh, he does not answer, you would like us to call him in, because he will answer us. Very good. Now let's go on to the second letter, if I may, for a minute. This is January 2187. Again to Mr. Gilliam, Deputy Assistant Secretary at uh, HUD, from Mr. Wilson, saying, our client, Mr. Leonard Briscoe, has advised that your staff has questioned the amount, etc. And at the bottom it says, please note that Payne Weber's commitment to underwrite the bonds nevertheless remains in effect. Uh, Mr. Briscoe is your client, all right, but he's also a partner of Mr. Wilson, isn't he? That's my understanding, yes. Would you find that this would have constituted a conflict of interest? <coughs> well, um, uh, this is, um, let's put it this way. If an employee owns an interest in a company or a project in, in this particular case. And uh, there is a proposal that, that Payne Weber do a financing, be it private, public, wh whatever, for that project. The, the question of is there uh, a, a conflict clearly is there. It's uh, supposed to be considered by the people making the commitment. But if but the, should he if, be the one handling it? I mean, you have you just testified that there are twelve thousand five hundred employees you have. He is clearly not the only employee who no. can deal no. with an eighty million dollar loan commitment to an individual with whom he is partners in another business. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would agree that it strikes uh, me as not a good procedure for the employee who has the commitment, who has the, the equity ownership in the project to be the one dealing with uh, his, his partners, if you will, on the other side and in, in, in making any financial decision. That ought to be a decision made by the head of the department who doesn't have an equity interest in the project and, presumably, and presumably would be more objective. You Absolutely. Do you agree with that, Mr. Moran? Absolutely. So both letters really, entirely apart from the question as to whether Mr. Barba at any time authorized Mr. Wilson to write these letters, clearly should not have been written by him. Isn't that true? That would be my conclusion. Would that be your conclusion? That Mr. would be my conclusion. Are you stunned by this, um, Mr. Moran? I'm surprised. I've not seen these letters before. Well, I, now, now that you have, describe I'd, to me your reaction as head of Payne Weber. I'd like to get a lot more information quickly. Well, I want you to get a lot more information quickly, <laughs> and, and knowing your cooperative yeah. attitude, I'm yeah. sure you'll share it with us quickly. But just, just on the face of it, you are aware of the fact that Mr. Wilson has a 15% interest in Mr. Brisco, one of Mr. Briscoe's properties. 
you, you are aware of that. Yes, I know that. He advised you of yeah, that yeah. When, when you hired him. Right. So that's not an issue. This loan commitment of $80 million relates to Mr. Briscoe. Is that correct? It, that's what it says in the letter, yes. That's what it says in the letter. Yeah. Is it not palpably evident on the face of it that this letter should never have been written on Payne Weber stationery signed by Wilson, who has a partnership relationship with Briscoe? I think it's clear that any Payne Weber employee that is making a commitment, whether authorized or not, that involves a transaction in which he has an interest or a special relationship ought to get very careful uh, approval in consultation with other people in the organization. Please. Can I ask you, is it against company policy for this to, be allow to, to allow this to happen? I mean, is, is, this, is there a policy established? Uh, there is not a policy because, as you know, in the financial business, many employees can have passive interests, passive investments in various organizations, mutual funds, partnerships, mm -hmm. corporations. Uh, our requirements are first that any such investment, other than a normal one of a mutual fund, let's say, has to be reported. So that's a policy? That's mm -hmm. a policy. And so, that's uh, a policy. to the best of your knowledge, was that done? And I understand that was done when okay. he joined Payne Weber. Um, I would say, however, that normally good business practice would be if you were working on a transaction that involved an entity which in any way you had a financial interest, you should make sure that you go to your boss and say, I'm involved in this fashion, let's make sure that we but follow this, the procedure. This is, a little, this is a little more than that, Mr. Maron. I mean, it seems to me that if I am a Payne Weber employee and I own 10 shares of IBM, that doesn't, shouldn't right. preclude me from working on right. papers involving IBM. But if I'm a 15% equity owner with another individual, for me to make commitments on behalf of Payne Weber to the tune of $80 million to my business partner is a, is a horse of a very different color, isn't it? I think it is a horse of a different color. Mr. Chairman, as I said, I'd like to know more about this very Fair quickly. Enough. Fair enough. Um, we have a whole array of very questionable uh, expenses uh, paid for by Payne Weber on the basis of submissions by Mr. Wilson. And I do not wish to prolong this any further but I, I, for instance, Tom Demery and his wife are treated to a dinner for $235. Um, ten HUD officials are offered refreshments for $441. It seems to me, that, uh, numbers of others, all of these need to be clarified by you gentlemen, and I'm sure you will, one way or the other. I mean, if he claims that these are personal expenditures, then I don't think they ought to be paid for by Payne Weber. And if they are business expenditures representing Payne Weber vis-a-vis -vis HUD, then it's perfectly proper for him to claim reimbursements, but then, then we need to look into the nature of those relationships. Congressman Shays. Thank you, and I thank both of you for being here. Um, my understanding is that uh, Lance Wilson uh, began employment uh, at Payne Weber on March 31st, 1986, and that he then um, went on leave of absence in August of this year, and it is a paid leave of absence. Uh, can you tell us uh, if, in your judgment, Mr. Uh, Lance Wilson cooperated fully and completely uh, with your investigation, answered all your questions, was willing to meet with you, uh, when you wanted to meet with him, responded to your phone calls when you called, was he a very cooperative employee in terms of helping you, un, you know, in conduct your investigation? Was he moderately helpful? How would you categorize his assistance? Um, Mr. Shea, su subject to the, this, this exception, or perhaps to uh, the, um, his... Um, 
and declining to provide tax returns and other personal data, which we requested, and subject to some um, perhaps un unsatisfactory answers about the T&E, which we have talked about, we think he has been cooperative. He has um, generally been willing to meet with us. He what, has, is what does generally mean? I, don't, I, I want to put that in perspective. Uh, well, I, it doesn't mean that we call him and say, be here in five minutes and he's here. If we call and ask to schedule a meeting within Let me be clear, though. He, is, days, he is an employee of yours. He is, he is on your payroll right that's now. That's correct. Absolutely. You have the ability to, to require him to come in every day to receive his paycheck, don't you? No. No? That's why he's on leave. He's not physically there. Okay. I need to understand a paid leave. Then help me understand it. Okay. Paid uh, leave. Do you have any obligation to pay him? We, he is uh, uh, an employee, and we have not terminated him. We have a verbal agreement that he is paid a base salary of, I believe it's $100,000 a year, with a discretionary bonus to be determined, totally open-ended, subject to the discretion of his superiors, his immediate superiors, at, at, at year end. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying... I, I, how? Why did we put him in, in that particular status? Because we didn't want to prejudge. Okay. We, we, because we, we have a very selfish motive here, too, is that I, we I want to be arbitrary and, dis and dismiss him and then be hit with a lawsuit for excuse wrongful excuse discharge. Excuse uh, I, I, I haven't talked about dismissal. I haven't talked about it. Okay. Those are things you've raised. All I know is that he's on your payroll. And I want to know if, if he's not well and can't come to work, that's one thing. If you have decided because of the controversy it doesn't make sense for him to be working for you right now, that's another. Uh, the question I'm asking is, uh, basically he is an employee of yours, and do you have the ability to just tell him that uh, he's to report to work? Uh, Mr. Shays, I... I I've never thought about it that way. Okay. I, I, let me, can I go back to your second characterization mm -hmm. that we said, go on leave until you get this straightened out? Mm -hmm. That's what we've done. That's what we tried to do. We haven't, I don't think, thought to ourselves, does that mean we can summon him back on six hours notice it? Mm -hmm. When we have asked... His attorney has been present? Uh, I think we have never spoken to him, either personally or on the telephone. Uh, to ask questions unless his attorney was physically there or on the telephone, but can I just verify that? Let me be clear. How often that. did you meet with him to, to conduct this investigation? Let me tell you the question, so if you need to consult. Sure. I'd like to know how often you met with him uh, and for how long during the course of your investigation. Your investigation took from what period to what period? That's uh, really would be helpful. I'd like to know when you started your investigation, when you ended it. I'd like to know uh, how often you met with Lance Wilson and for how long? Sure. We uh, started it on approximately August 24, if you'll give me the... Uh, uh, August 10th? I'm sorry, I stand corrected, August 10th. Uh, when we met with, we met with uh, Mr. Wilson first for a period that extended over two days. Uh, the interview started in the early afternoon early early afternoon or mid-afternoon, extended into the evening, resumed the next day, and extended through the morning until about uh, lunchtime is my recollection. Since that time... Were we, there transcripts of those? No, sir. No transcripts? No, no, we did not have a reporter present. But his, his attorney was present during that period of time. Uh, subsequent to that, we have had uh, placed telephone calls to both Mr. Wilson with his attorney on the phone and to his attorney separately. And if you want me to give you a number of telephone calls, I'm going to have to turn no, no, around I get the general idea, before. though, that you had a fairly extensive interview with uh, Lance Wilson. I mean, that's fairly clear yeah, to me. I, I, I would yeah. say so. Um, but is it your testimony before this committee that you didn't think about the personal expenses and whether or not uh, he should be uh, reprimanded for them, uh, asked to pay them back, um, or did you just view this as a minor little part of a major issue? No, we didn't view it as minor because we, we, we mentioned it in our, our, our testimony. We laid it out. Uh, we did not focus no, the on... the fact the that you mentioned it doesn't mean to me that you consider it an issue. We do consider it an issue. Okay. So uh, let me be completely clear about that. We did not focus on the T&E in terms of going through them and beginning to, to uh, raise questions. 
until the last week of our investigation. Uh, and you asked the question earlier how long our investigation continued. It was still going on at 11 o'clock in the morning on the 22nd when we were trying to get our, our testimony uh, facts down, down to the uh, um, committee. Did, did you ever ask him if he, uh, during this investigation, if he ever made uh, money off of any projects, had outside income? We asked him several times if he had performed outside consulting work while a Payne Weber employee, and the answer was consistently no. Uh, was he under oath with you? I mean, was no, we don't have yeah. the authority yeah. to okay. administer oaths, but yeah. there was this was not a legal process uh, in which you were taking depositions or anything like that. Uh, in, in the strict sense of a deposition being under oath, uh, that's correct. Yes. Uh, so now you uh, you didn't focus on the expense account and and have thought maybe you should focus a little more on that. I mean, you did focus on it, but in Late terms in the of the, and and now you're learning that he may have been a consultant may have been charging money on the outside. Uh, you knew that he uh, had a 15% interest in a particular project, but you're unaware of the fact that he may have actually been conducting um, Payne Weber business with a firm and signing his name on something in which he had a financial uh, involvement. Is that not correct, sir? Um, who were the references for Lance Wilson when you hired him? Uh, the references were the law firm of Mudge, Rose, Guthrie, pardon me, Guthrie, uh, and Alexander, which is a, a prominent New York City firm. Um, the Equitable Life Assurance Society, which is a, one of the largest insurance companies in the country where he had been in their legal department for a period of time after he had been at Mudge, Rose and the Housing Development Corporation, the New York City entity that is referred to. I know those three were checked. The responses from... Um, Let me ask you, uh, was anyone at HUD used as a reference? The... My recollection... Let me be of, very specific. Was Samuel Pierce used as a reference? I am not aware that he was. Okay. Are you not aware that he was? or I you was going to... It, yeah. If, uh, say, I, my recollection of looking at the personnel file is that these three were checked. I don't recall any reference to Secretary Pierce. No, that's not what I asked uh, specifically. I didn't ask if you checked with those references. I asked if he used them as references. I am not aware that he okay. did. Could you check your records to see and, to. and get back to the committee if we that would be the case? We would be delighted to. Make sure I understand. Did he use Secretary Pierce or anyone else at HUD? as a reference when he applied to Payne Weber? Correct. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Um, the Wall Street Journal in September 22nd reported that, I'm not all that sure how important it is, but I would like to just pursue it for a second, had, um, uh, had a dinner for Samuel Pierce at Payne Weber uh, in the executive dining room for 40 participants on February 25th, 1988. Can you tell us a little about that? Uh, One, did it happen, and two, uh, yeah, what yeah, happened? I, I, I can. Um, the, um, that, that dinner was um, uh, hosted or, uh, by an organization called the Global Economic Action Institute. And um, uh, I don't have the literature on them with me, but they generally uh, describe themselves as being interested in economic problems in the third world and, and that sort of, sort of thing. The, uh, that organization uh, selected uh, Secretary Pierce as an individual to honor at an event at which they were, uh, in effect, a fundraiser for that organization. Uh, Mr. Wilson asked uh, if um, he could use the facilities to host uh, the function. Uh, the function occurred. Uh, Payne Weber picked up um, the cost of uh, the, the, what would be, the, in effect, the rental of the facility and the food. About $3,500 is my recollection. Was it at your facility? I'm sorry. I'm yes, it was. Okay. It's on 34. And uh, the facility occurred. Uh, the facility occurred. The, the event occurred. Um, it, uh, as you say, had about 40 people there. Uh, I can't tell you all who, who they were. My recollection is there were two or three Payne Weber employees there, Mr. Reiser, Mr. Edelman, 
Uh, none of the senior officers was there. And this is um, just as a, a general statement about the, uh, our facilities. We do allow them to be used by any number of organizations uh, that seem to be worthwhile, charitable, educational. And you sometimes pay for them? Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, there had been some talk that, that um, Lance Wilson may have tried to promote Samuel Pierce uh, to be a member of the board of Payne Weber. Was that just uh, talk or did, are either of you aware that that was something that uh, Lance Wilson wanted to see happen? Yeah, Lance Wilson, um, through my staff, um, asked if he could bring in Mr. Pierce. And I think it was January or February of 1989. And uh, the message was that Mr. Pierce had been on the board of General Electric and the Prudential Insurance Company and Scott Paper and other very distinguished corporations before he went in government and he was now out of government and he would like to look around to see what kind of board opportunities were available and would I meet with him. And he was a member of Congress, a member of Congress, sorry. Let me just say, I have no problem with you yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. having that meeting. Yeah. I, I, I do have a question mark in my mind about uh, the relationship between Lance Wilson, Samuel Pierce's mm -hmm. former chief of staff, All right. um, uh, and uh, what that relationship may have been, why they were, uh, one was at HUD and one wasn't, right. and if that gave Mr. W uh, Wilson some golden opportunities to influence HUD decisions. I mean, that's obviously uh, what I'm interested yeah, in. That meeting took place after Samuel Pierce had left? I think the first meeting was the end of January, or it was after the inauguration. Yeah. So that would be after he'd left. Yeah. yeah. But, but Mr. Shays, it's, yes. it's clear just to, to make sure that uh, the, the concept uh, that you were focusing on, focusing on did, did Mr. Wilson, was this his idea? Yes. The answer to that is yes. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, I have to tell you that I have a bit of a problem uh, with this individual, Lee Barba, uh, because I just want to put him in perspective. He was Lance Wilson's boss, is that not correct? At the time uh, uh, Lance Wilson was hired, uh, Lee Barber was head of the municipal securities group and, and, and uh, Lance reported directly to him. So that uh, as time progressed, however, Mr. Barba moved on up and there were some other people who would have been the direct supervisor of, of, but, of Mr. But, Wilson. But, but direct supervisor is probably a good term, but Municipal Securities Group is under the subgroup of Fixed Income Department. That is of, correct. Of which uh, Lee Barba was was in charge. At the time he left Payne Weber, he was in charge of the fixed income group, uh, fixed income department. He uh, assumed that position in late the year before, approximately? I think so. I don't remember the exact date. We think it was late in, in 88, but we'd be delighted to pin that down for you. Uh, were you, um, was there ever an indication that um, he was directly the supervisor of Lance Wilson and that ultimately a few few people were in between, but he was ultimately uh, Lance Wilson's boss. Uh, so that's a fair way, yes. Yeah. Was, um, may I ask you, is, there, is it, uh, without it being a personal response, and then you can tell me it is, uh, Lee Barba left for what reason, uh, if you can tell me? I, I, I can tell you what has been reported to me that, that he said, so I'm okay. about two steps away if you talk about the hearsay rule, that he had an opportunity at Bankers Trust that was uh, okay. attractive let to me, him. Let me, I'll pursue it this way. He left voluntarily. There was no one at Payne Weber who wanted him to leave? Well, there are I don't mean no one. No one's that I have some of my own staff who <laughs> yeah, might be Yeah, I, that's some. what you understand the point. And the answer there, there was no um, uh, effort on the part of the senior management, the, the executive committee, the executive group of Payne Weber. Uh, no one asked Mr. Barber to leave. No one urged him to leave. As a matter of fact, just a personal observation, when I heard that he was leaving, uh, I was stunned. I was stunned, surprised by it. See, the, the reason is that the, the reason why I'm asking is that a letter like this that that Lance Wilson is is writing that says we the undersigned has authority to issue this commitment on behalf of Payne Weber the letters that you've been seen clearly Lance Wilson should not have done that that's that's a given here uh, and ultimately uh, you're telling me the person who should have done it is the very individual has left who now has really not been all that cooperative with you 
uh, in terms of helping you understand what Lance Wilson did. Wouldn't you say, wouldn't you, wasn't it fair to say without uh, people like Lee Barba helping you, uh, your investigation, without his full and complete cooperation, your investigation of, of, of Lance Wilson is uh, significantly impaired. I, I guess we, we might have a friendly debate about significantly, but clearly impaired. There are a lot of questions we would like to have asked. There, were, there are a lot of other areas where we could get information from other people, but he was one of the, logically, who would you want to talk to when you do an investigation? You talk to the person, you talk to their supervisor. You made a good faith effort to investigate what Lance Wilson has done. That's your statement to us. My resp and, and I'm not challenging that. Um, uh, but my response is that uh, I also hear you telling me that given that you couldn't speak to someone like uh, Lee Barba uh, directly and uh, for some time, that um, there are significant holes in, in your investigative effort that um, uh, certainly don't give you the opportunity to exonerate him from, from any uh, potential wrongdoing. No, and I, uh, that, that's correct, Mr. Shays, and I think if you look at our report, we tried to be care very careful um, that we, I don't think we exonerated, we came down neutral in most areas. Let me ask you about Food for Africa. Sure. Food for Africa was uh, something that the, uh, the Inspector General found um, uh, very curious. You had Tom Demery, who was head of, of FHA Commissioner, the Assistant Secretary, uh, determining who would get these uh, uh, units, uh, rent subsidies, tax credits. The tax credits, obviously, are a very key point here. Um, after he gets his position, Food for Africa starts getting a great deal of income. One of the biggest promoters of Food for Africa was Lance Wilson. Uh, Lance Wilson invited uh, uh, various people to come and to contribute. They all, well, the ones we know happen to have been developers. They had a direct relationship uh, to, uh, in benefiting from decisions made by HUD. Um, Payne Weber, I think, on July of 86 contributed $4,254 and, and um, April of 87, 5000 uh, Did you contribute any more money than that, do you know? Um, uh, Mr. Shays, uh, first of all, I didn't recall the first one. I recall the 5000 but obviously you have it. So I, I well, don't no, let me just say something. I have a Xerox copy in which we're trying uh, uh, to get the uh, lines to okay. throw. I, so. I don't know of any beyond that, but again, may I just... Yes. No, I, to the best of your ability, what is the total amount that you think Payne Weber contributed? Well, that adds up to nine, a little over nine thousand dollars. Okay, don't go by my figure. Go by whatever figure you have. We okay. Someone who worked specifically on this issue tells me that we only know five of our own knowledge. Okay, we're you, not challenging the other. We just no, no, no. Don't that's know. that's fine. No, uh, I would like this. Is my second request uh, would be to know if if Payne Weber contributed any more uh, in this account or any other accounts, the one that the five thousand came out of. Um, what was the reason for this contribution? <coughs> it was requested by Mr. Wilson, as, as uh, I recall. It was, um, and I'm, I'm speaking now of the 5,000. Um, it was also char charged back to the Municipal Securities Group as an expense, as, as I recall. And our policy on, um, as to why we have a general policy that we like, Payne Weber likes to make charitable donations of to uh, many entities. Um, I did uh, try as best I could to just give, get a sampling. I mean, you have Food for Africa. We also have the Red Cross, Sloan Kettering, the Blind Babies. You don't have to do that. You know, but, but my point is, if it sounds like a good organization and it appears regular on the surface, and I would say that Food for Africa on the surface sounds like a good organization, but I seem to be learning a lot more about it than I might have known a few months ask ago. Mr. Wilson about Food for Africa? I'll have to ask. Okay. Uh, uh, the indication is we, we did not question him uh, about it. Let me just um, ask you this last question, and maybe I'm exposing my ignorance here. Um, your investigation of Lance Wilson, uh, it wasn't criminal in nature. You hadn't prejudged anything. Um, 
what, why was there, why would an employee feel it uh, necessary? What was the explanation for why you would even need an attorney um, present when you were questioning him? I, I, I'm, I'm having, it, and it's, it's behind closed doors. Uh, it's not, uh, you're not even taking transcripts. Um, so I'm just having a hard time reconciling that. I mean, you know, if, if I said to my employer, you know, uh, I'll talk to you, but I gotta have my lawyer present. If I were an employer, I'd say, gosh, I'm not sure that you're right for us. I mean, but maybe that's wrong. I mean, maybe I'm just missing something in this, in this system that I just, uh, uh, it would just, it would, it would say to me that somehow our relationship had changed. Yeah, uh, Mr. Mr. Shays, I, I, I think, um, if I might agree with you, I, I, I think you perhaps are missing something that was at least important to us. Uh, we, quite frankly, uh, did not want to question Mr. Wilson unless his attorney were present. We, he already had an attorney that was reported and you had summoned him down here on the 28th of July and, and, and so we knew that he had already retained an attorney to represent him in connection with HUD matters generally, if you will. I'm going to get there. And for us to have then questioned him on his dealings with HUD without his attorney being present, if we were subsequently to make a decision that we wanted to take some action or to terminate him, we were fearful of potential liability and a lawsuit. Now maybe that was caution on our part, maybe strikes you as excessive caution, but I, I that, really was, don't know. that I, was the rationale. I, I mean, we, we really wanted to be neutral and down the middle see, and if his attorney could help fine uh, well see yeah. i guess the thing is though that in the process i'm making an assumption that maybe i shouldn't make that you were looking at lance wilson but you were also looking at your own company that's correct um you this wasn't an investigation per se just of lance wilson you wanted to know what was had your company done had your company done anything improper and i guess um he could have been very helpful in that effort and it's just a, a, just a curiosity to me that, that somehow um, you felt that um, that was, was necessary. And maybe I'll have people later on tell me why it was obvious that you should have had that happen. But he's on your payroll. Um, it's alleged he was you know, not accounting for his, his finances properly, uh, that he had separate income, which is against company policy, that he used a letter uh, and signed a letter in which he claimed he had the authority, which you're telling us he did not have the authority, um, and yet you're, and yet he's on your payroll. It's an interesting relationship. Well, <laughs> but uh, to be resolved, I guess. Okay. Uh, I, I would just say that uh, just on this point of the the attorney be, being present, quite frankly, um, and, and maybe this is the cautious. Uh, I, I do wear an attorney's hat sometimes. Cautious attorney in me, in me coming out, but the idea of uh, calling an employee in to question them in an area where they are rep represented by counsel in a very visible public, on a very visible public issue would, would, would strike me as being, but I can't point you to any canon of ethic that says that that's my sense of how you ought to do it Thank in terms of being Thank fair. Thank you for your candidate. Thank you, Congressman Schumer. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And first, let me uh, thank the witnesses for coming here and testifying we, your employee, I guess he still is your employee on leave, is not being as uh, forthcoming as you are, and uh, for whatever that indicates. Uh, my first question in general is about this investigation you did, and I think it is worth pursuing. In many instances, it seems clearly. the investigation just talked to Wilson and then believed him on his face. I think it's clearly. Did you try to go beyond Wilson? Let me give you an example. Sure. Uh, Wilson says he didn't lobby HUD on the, uh, the, the uh, HUD contract which Chemical Bank had first been chosen for and then Payne Weber was, the, this is was the, given. This is the advisory contract. Right, the advisory uh, contract. Did you go try to find out if he did? Well, um, may I just refer to a couple of pages just to re refresh my, my sure. recollection? First of all, we didn't try to contact Mr. Kovitz. Right. Um, because again, I quite frankly thought that would have been a wasted quarter for a phone call. I just, just didn't, didn't think it. 
Uh, I, my recollection, and I'm let me get to it, is that we did ask someone else. Um, Mr. Edelman about about contacts uh, on uh, between Wilson and HUD. Edelman and he, was no longer working for you at that time. At the time we asked Mr. Edelman, he was not working for us, that he believed that Mr. Wel Wilson spoke to uh, some people about general status and summarizing it, but that he didn't play any, any substantive role. Uh, and that Mr. Edelman knows of nothing, uh, of no influence being used in, in improperly uh, to, to uh, in connection with the award of the contract. Now, I didn't and quite I, understand that. If he made some calls, yeah, and Edelman question. knows of calls, Call. but not influence being used, I mean, that, what do you do other than make a phone call when you're trying to uh, influence people? <laughs> you don't go over and take the guy's arm and twist it behind his back, literally. No, say, but uh, my understanding of the calls, it was to check on the general status and I, it, it would strike you me. You don't think he ever tried to make a persuasive case that that's, the group that's of seven was wrong? That's my point. They called to check on status, but, but not aware that um, he But did, on that issue, as in, as in so many others here, would you agree that it would be wrong for the public as well as for this committee to rely on your uh, report because so much of it is based simply on what Lance Wilson said? Now, I'm not implying that Payne Weber itself is doing no, I, anything I, I, wrong. I, 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 mean, I, underst I understand. I think it's very fair to say that uh, it, it would be to really fi find out and to cross-check beyond what we have been able to do so, which we would like to have done. It sure as heck would have been nice if we could have talked to some more people. But we ran out of people to talk to. And that's because you people would not talk to you? It w would not talk to us, or in the case of the uh, HUD officials, our assumption, maybe it's wrong, that they would not talk to us. I thought that was a pretty good assumption at the time, but... Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, did... Can, can I just, just, just sure, finish, though, uh, to, just to stick with this on, 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 the, on the report? I, I have to tell you, from, from Wilson's point of view, you know, whatever Wilson did, the report seems a little bit, uh, well to be kind, undocum un unsubstantiated other than relying on his word. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Schumer, if, if we had found um, a letter or a memorandum uh, or handwritten notes or anything in, in the vast uh, number of documents that we looked at that, and we did not find anything that read something like, Dear Joe, boy, did you really pull this one out for you. We'd be here waving it to the committee and saying something very different. But unfortunately, telephone calls are not memorialized in writing. It's Wilson on you one side and the other party. You had complete access to all of Wilson's own files. So other than his, the personal stuff we were talking about, we believe we did. Yes. There's no evidence that some No of evidence that he, he did uh, pull th things out. Mm -hmm. But you didn't have his income tax returns? Did not have his income tax returns, no, sir. Okay. Um, Okay, but I, you don't think it would be unfair to state that the report is at best incomplete on Mr. Wilson's own doings? I, I, not saying I think why, that, no, not I characterizing I, why no, I, it's I, I incomplete. Under, I understand. I, I guess, I, again, I'd be a little bit defensive and say it slightly differently, is that the report went as far as we were able to take it in terms of an internal Two investigation. Two statements aren't but contradictory. But we would like to have gone further and if I were wearing my old hat as a law enforcement officer, I'd be out there asking the other people are certainly trying to do so. Okay. The uh, next question I have relates to uh, Battle Fowler mm -hmm. arrangements. Do, has your firm, I take it it was Wilson who recommended Battle Fowler to several of these other underwriters? Uh, well, we have uh, Mr. Wilson and Mr. Edelman both having um, slightly different recollections, I, but we believe that he did recommend them, yes. Has your firm recommend, does your Excuse firm... Me, Mr. Chairman, could you just make sure that's clarified? I'd like to know what each, what Mr. Wilson said and Mr. Edelberg said okay. on... on uh, this is a key point that you're... So that I make sure I say it correctly, can uh, I get you, to the yes. page rather you than say, speaking off the top of my head? You said that there's a disagreement as to who recommended the law, how, who recommended the law firm. Okay. 
This is Samuel Pierce's former law firm. I understand that. Yeah. I, I, I think I understand why the question's there. Like, you can, may I just read, and I don't mean this to be well, mechanical, can, but... Just, I just... Uh, it, sure. And I thank you. I think it, it should be clear. Because I, 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 I want to make sure that, that I don't um, mischaracterize uh, anything. In his interview, Mr. Edelman indicated that while performing the financial advisory work, he spoke to Mr. Wilson only once or twice. One conversation related to the selection of Battle Fowler as underwriter's counsel on the sale of the public facilities loans. Mr. Edelman stated that Mr. Wilson indicated to him that he thought that when it came to doing due diligence, Battle Fowler was well qualified. Mr. Edelman stated that he believed Mr. Wilson contacted Goldman to recommend that they consider Battle Fowler as their counsel. Mr. Wilson indicated to us that he did not contact Goldman. Mr. Edelman stated that he had no prior knowledge of Mr. Pierce's former association with Battle Fowler. When it came to his attention, he discussed this matter with Mr. Wilson and asked him about any continuing relationship between Battle Fowler and Mr. Pierce. Mr. Wilson assured him that there was no continuing relationship and that Mr. Wilson had recommended Battle Fowler simply because he thought it was a good real estate law firm. And I have one more paragraph, I, if you bear with me. In his interview, Mr. Wilson indicated that he suggested the use of Battle Fowler because he thought well of that firm and knew that Goldman had used them on numerous other transactions. That Goldman had used them. Goldman, Goldman Sachs. He also stated his belief that Battle Fowler had been Goldman's counsel in its bid to be financial advisor. Mr. Wilson stated that he did not discuss the use of Battle Fowler as underwriter's counsel with Mr. Pierce or anyone else at HUD. That's How, however, I got, however, Mr. Wilson stated that subsequent to the selection of Battle Fowler as underwriter's counsel, Mr. Wilson called and left a message for Mr. Pierce advising him of the selection of Battle Fowler. Mr. Wilson stated that he did this merely as a friendly courtesy since Battle Fowler was Mr. Pierce's old firm. It's quite friendly. Um, uh, there are some more statements that are hey, that about... Do, do you, do in, you have any knowledge, I mean, or could you find out if you don't have it here, when Battle Fowler was actually selected? I guess that's really not um, your job. That's Goldman uh, and Salomon's. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, um, have you used Battle Fowler in any other activities, as best you know? As best I know, I can't remember, and I uh, can tell you that if we have, it would be uh, de minimis because I can sort of rattle off the top 40 firms that we, we represent and that represent us. And, and I, I don't recall ever seeing any bills from them. On so only when saying. Mr. Wilson was involved, it seems, was Battle Fowler there off the top of your head. But not representing us. Yeah, I way. understand yeah. that. Um, okay, well, I'd like to find out, because I, if it's not in the record, I think this memo, which Wilson did mention, had this, this, we have a memo here before okay. us. Uh, maybe a copy oh, can be given. Okay. It's transcribed. It's sort of handwritten. It's... It's a confidential, it's to Star B. Eckert, confidential assistant to the secretary. And it's per Lance, here's what it says. I, I assume it went to Pierce, but we're not sure. It's two. It's a phone message that was transcribed. It says, per Lance, first round of asset sales, public facility at Ginny May deal closed. Goldman Sachs manager, Battle Fowler Council. Group two, multifamily should close at the end of September. Salomon selected as lead firms. Salomon selected Battle Fowler as their counsel as well. What I just want to do here, and I know the chairman's in a hurry to move along, is square the dates. But Wilson, I guess my first question is, he, he told you this what day? That, I think that would be important. I mean, because he did say that he called Pierce's office, and that's... He, he told us this in the interview we had with him in... August, August of this year. In August of this of, of year. Of this year, that's correct. And was that before this memo was made public? I think that's important to know. Well, I don't know when the memo's been public. 
Oh, so this memo may have appeared publicly. I guess we don't have to ask you to do that, but the staff ought to do that to find out if he was <coughs> being meticulous only after something appeared publicly or really was trying to fully answer your questions uh, um, beforehand. But that's not I, I, I suggest to I my colleague that you'll continue with your questioning after we Well, I'm just about finished, you, Mr. Chairman, and I know This is our second ring. Hmm? This is the second ring for the yeah. vote. Okay. We'd yeah. be delighted to get you the dates that those financings occurred and, and tell you what we know. No problem. Okay. Just one other quick question, if that would be all right. Sure. Did contradictions in Wilson's testimony, testimony's the wrong word, Wilson's uh, interviews spring up fairly regularly? No. Okay. Occasionally, not at all. I mean, there's obviously the one between Edelman and Occasionally. him. Occasionally, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. We'll be in recess for just a few minutes, and then we'll conclude with you, gentlemen. No, I'm not going to Subcommittee will resume. I believe uh, members have finished their questioning. I wonder if either of you gentlemen would like to make any statements at this stage. Yes, I would. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, say, first of all, that I think it is important that this, be, this investigation be carried on as thoughtfully and as completely as it can. It affects uh, all of us, not just in business or politics, but at, as citizens. I'd also like to say that we stand ready to cooperate in every way possible with the committee. You have asked for certain further information. I'm sure that Mr. Treadway will make sure that it's made available to you. And as things develop, if there's any other way that myself or any other employee of Payne Weber can help in the process, we will absolutely do so. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Con Mr. Mr. Treadley. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would just simply underscore uh, what Mr. Marin has said, and, and uh, if, if uh, short of uh, appearing again, you would like for us to spend time with the staff reviewing documents, I will make myself available whenever you request. I appreciate it very much. Uh, I'll call on Congressman Shays now. I, I just want to publicly thank you for your cooperation and say that one thing that would be helpful, because I think your investigation really is an ongoing investigation, uh, that if you do uncover anything that you think is pertinent to this committee, uh, without our requesting it, if you would forward it on, I think that would be very helpful to us and would be very appreciated. Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> before I release you, I would merely like to ask you, I know you'll follow up on all of the items we have hanging loose. Um, I want to express my appreciation for your outstanding cooperation. It was a pleasure working with, with your staffs and with the two of you. Thank you. We appreciate thank you that. For, very thank much. you for joining thank us. You we're oh, we're finished. Okay. The go. last panel today is Mr. Dick uh, Udaly, former regional administrator in the Fort Worth office of HUD, Mr. Walter Sevier, former Deputy Regional Administrator at the Fort Worth office of HUD. You gentlemen come up to the witness table. Raise your right hand, please. You solemnly swear to...